more tired from walking Lord, I'm so alone And Lord, the dark is creeping in It's creeping up to swallow me I think I'll stop Rest here a while This is all Good morning, Simpson Wood. I hope this week has found you well, um, resting in place, a safe distance from everyone else as a part of your being faithful uh, to what is really needed in our world now. I want to share just a couple of announcements very quickly. You may have seen this change this week. Um, we are now moving from two communications a week to one, and that will come out on Fridays until we gather back together. So just watch for that change. Going forward on a weekly basis, you're going to see the link to worship on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, go ahead and, and show up and be emailed to you on Saturday. If you would like to be included in that and you're not receiving this email, I, I just invite you to reach out through the church webpage um, and, and to ask uh, to be included in future communication. And the last announcement I, I want to make is um, just to, to watch closely, we are moving very quickly toward our grow groups being online. Uh, a lot of work has been done in that area this week. 
and uh, many of our grow groups are going to be invited uh, to gather together virtually following worship like this each week at 1030. So watch for that change. Um, a final word is continue to be, I invite everybody to continue to be generous as you are. This is an incredible church. If you're listening um, and are a part of another church, continue to support the church where you are present um, with your faithfulness. Um, that is needed in all times and especially in this time. It's the way that we partner joyfully and trust with all that God uh, does for us so richly in Christ Jesus. I want to share a story this morning from Mark's Gospel that is recorded early on in Jesus' ministry when he is still at Galilee teaching uh, and healing large crowds. From Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter, um, we hear these words. Later that day, when evening came, Jesus said to them, let's cross over to the other side of the lake. They left the crowd and took him in the boat just as he was. Other boats followed along. Gale force winds arose, waves crashed against the boat so that it was swamped. But Jesus was in the rear of the boat, sleeping on a pillow. They woke him and said, Teacher, don't you even care that we are drowning? He got up and gave orders to the wind and said to the lake, Be silent. Be still. The wind settled down and there was a great calm. Jesus asked them, Why are you frightened? Do you have no faith yet? Overcome with awe, the disciples said to one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. May God always add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing and proclamation of his word. Would you pray with me? O oh God, open our hearts, our ears, our minds to see the ways that you would speak to us this day. Speak through your servant. Give us courage to respond in ways that, that share faith, hope, and love in our practice as we live out your love for us in Jesus Christ. Amen. I've heard it said that a great story is one that you want to read more than once or that you find you are just compelled to, you have to.
for their new insights and the journey that the author takes you on is one where you discover new things or are changed as you make the journey uh, each and every time. I believe that's not only true in Scripture, but it's especially true in the story that we see in Mark's Gospel this morning. In it, we find Jesus at the end of a ministry um, that has taken place around Galilee. It's clustered in all of chapters 3 and 4. We find episodes of, of healing on a Sabbath day, teaching in front of large crowds, um, struggle within family, and we find um, a, a practice, some practices and patterns of Jesus that um, lead us to understand his ministry better in that place and point in time. It was characterized by huge crowds. We are told, for example, in, in chapter 3, that on, on the day in which Jesus healed on the Sabbath, he withdrew then to the shore. It's interesting that, that those words are words that are used, that he um, withdrew to the shore and there the crowds had followed him following uh, a, a time of healing. He then, avoiding uh, being crushed, he uh, calls on the disciples, those who were the fishermen, uh, James and John, um, Peter and Andrew, to uh, lend him a boat where he can push out just from shore a bit so that he can teach. There in that part of the gospel, we're told that it's actually a, a small boat. Um, we're, we're invited, I believe, to imagine um, in the next story, the one that we share in today, uh, that perhaps the boat was one, one that was a little bit larger. Uh, I've got a picture. You may have heard of the Jesus boat before, but back in 1986, a pair of Israeli brothers uh, made a discovery in the mud by the shore there at Galilee, um, where one of the larger boats it, that was imagined to be used one of two key ways, either as a, a ferry or as a boat that was used to troll a net behind. But this boat was unearthed and uh, it really was the most significant find of its kind, really in, in all of the years of archaeology around the, uh, the lakeside at Galilee. We see in that, uh, the reason why that's so important is we see in that an understanding of today's story. Jesus at the end of a day of teaching, and we can imagine healing, but all of chapter 4 is dedicated to teaching in one day. And there he pushes out, um, and, and in fact, we actually find the disciples take him just as he is. It's a significant uh, tell in the story that, that Jesus is completely exhausted. He is spent. And it's in this boat uh, that he begins, he invites the disciples to lead him to the other side of the lake. The lake is large. If you have ever been to uh, the lake at Galilee, it's three miles across. It's seven miles long. And in the, the midst of that, we can imagine a journey that might have been four, five, six miles from there at Capernaum over to the, the Jewish, I'm sorry, to the Gentile side there of the lake. But in, in the midst of that, Jesus is given the place um, where he is invited to rest. And so that's why a ferry boat, for example, might be imagined. Uh, we are told that uh, he lays his head on a pillow and it's there that, that he falls asleep as the journey begins. This is significant because we, we come to uh, understand a little bit better um, a world that we probably don't see at first in the story. From the crowds and from uh, being poured out in teaching and healing, Jesus really invites the disciples to invite him into their home away from home. The boat that the disciples lived so much of their lives on um, in every way was a, a time that they spent probably as much time as anywhere else. And so all the rules of hospitality 
really apply in this story. This is a story that leads us to understand hospitality and to think about it. The disciples are now in charge of care of Jesus. They are the hosts. He is the guest. With that understanding in place, we see the story very differently. Jesus is now the one who is invited to rest in the midst of the storm. We're given some new insights, though, that, that are interesting to reflect on. There are other boats that make the journey with Jesus, so we can imagine those who had them were traveling close by. It's a reminder to us of how little he was probably ever able to get away at this time in his life uh, from those who were continually making demands upon him. We, we're also um, led to a deeper understanding that um, this was a place of respite and the disciples in fact were invited uh, to do what a host does which is to take care and if a problem arises they are the ones that are supposed to handle it. Now when we're hosting others we probably think of problems a little bit differently than a, a storm on on a lake. Um, we probably think about what we've run out of or you know what has changed that uh, requires our attention. But uh, Jesus is in the disciples element particularly the fishermen and, and there we are invited uh, to, uh, to surely imagine the disciples being in control. But what we find in the story is a confrontation with a disciple's deepest fear. The sea was um, the, the Jewish person's uh, deepest uh, fear in that day. Even on a lake that, that stretched just a couple miles across, uh, in particular, we know a lot about the way storms could rise up and, and overwhelm in a very, very short time. It, it all related to the, the mountains that were nearby and the short pass with which wind and storms uh, would rush through. Uh, just know this if you haven't seen it before. Everything can change very, very quickly on the lake at Galilee there, on the Sea of Galilee. So. What we really find in the story is um, a, a parallel between a first response and a, a faith response. We, we know what that means intuitively. A first response when disaster uh, comes to us um, involves the, the questions that we always ask. Lord, don't you care about what's happening in our lives right now? I can imagine uh, some listening out this morning wondering, uh, you know, why is it that that disease is allowed to exist in our world? God, do you care about what's happening all around us? The disciples exhibit a first response to Jesus. What's interesting, I, I believe, in the story is that Jesus doesn't respond uh, the way that you might or that I might. Jesus does not respond directly to their questions, um, assuring them that his care for them um, will always, always be at the level, the point of their expectation. When I think of this story in light of our present reality, um, a couple thoughts come to mind to me. A first response is very natural. We're going to feel afraid or anxious. We're going to wonder, Oh God, what is it that you are up to in our world? Let me say this. Um, I hope this week that you will uh, simply uh, allow God to move you past a first response to a, a faith response. A faith response is one in which we um, come, I believe, uh, to, to Christ with the understanding that we don't have all of the answers, but that we are asking for Jesus to help us. I often read the, the gospel stories where we are told that the disciples 
didn't get some element in the story right. I read those um, wondering, you know, what was the response that Jesus was looking for where their question wouldn't have been necessarily met with another question that was meant to redirect them? I wonder in this story, what if the disciples had circled around and said, Jesus, we're scared. Uh, this is something that we should, we should be better at, but we just don't know uh, about the storm in which we're in now. We need your help. I believe that's absolutely a faith response to exclaim what we don't know, what we are not in control of, and what we need help with, all the while knowing uh, that, that Christ is with us. I love the end of the story. We find in it that the disciples are filled with awe. It's a, it's a great ending. I believe in every way that as we move past first responses to a faith response where we draw close to God, asking God to help us in our weakness, in our limitations, fears, anxieties, and all that we truly possess, and that we too will be those that find God's amazing power to do more than we can ask or imagine. Know that you are being prayed for this week, that you are beloved in God's sight. And I pray for you and for me, the faith journey uh, that is God's joy for us in Jesus Christ, God's gift to go with us, to lead us, to guide us every step of the way. Have a great week, church. Um, I hope that you will pray with me now for others, especially those who are serving selflessly, putting their lives um, at, at risk in order to help so many. Would you join me now in praying for them? Oh God, we lift up uh, those who are leading as servants in our world. We find them in government. We find them in, as first responders. We find them in um, the hospitals and the doctor's offices, but also we find them, O oh Lord, in the grocery stores for those who are willing to work to make sure that we have uh, something to eat. Uh, we find them in those who are uh, reaching out beyond themselves, um, taking risks so that, that we um, can stay a safe distance from others. We ask you to bless each one on our heart and mind are those uh, who are afraid, for those who uh, need your healing touch, and for those who serve selflessly. We pray for the ways you would move us uh, to live characterized by your faith that has been poured into our hearts first. So we live up the, the living of our lives. Some of us, O oh Lord, we will live in quiet this week, and that will be our act of faithfulness to you and to others others of us will run straight into danger. And we pray your protection for all, and we pray for the journey that we would make by faith. May you be overjoyed at our living. Uh, we will praise and bless your name now and forever. Amen. Have a great week, church, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Next week, um, I invite you to join at the Cross by Church. I will come um, filming Palm Sunday to you from the cross at the church. See you next week. In 1873, Horatio Spafford, a lawyer from Chicago, planned a trip to Europe for he, his wife, and their four daughters. Just days before the trip, he found out that he was going to have to stay behind for a few days for, to clear up a legal matter of one of his clients. So he sent his wife and their four children on ahead on the ship, the SS Ville du Havre. On the night of November 22nd, the Ville du Havre was hit at two o'clock in the morning, broadside by another ship at full speed. It's said that the Ville du Havre went down in less than 15 minutes. In that murky nighttime water, Mrs. Spafford somehow managed to survive, but their four children perished. Mrs. Spafford reached Wales, and upon reaching the safety of Wales, she telegraphed her husband these words. 
saved alone. Horatio, of course, got on the very next ship he possibly could to join his wife in Wales. It is said that the words to It Is Well With My Soul were written on this voyage across the Atlantic. Some people even believe that it was at the very place where the daughters had drowned that these words entered into his heart and his mind. This is still a very popular hymn today, and one reason is because it asks us, is it well with our souls?
I want to remind us of two practices as we go this week. Um, the first one uh, seems a little strange to me, but there's good reason for it. I'm going to invite you to share or like. If this service has been a blessing to you, um, there are many who are not able to get out for worship now. and There are many churches that are not able to share in online worship. And this may be the way that you're able to, to bless uh, someone else who is used to going to church. So I hope you will do that as a way of being in partnership with God. Um, this, the second thing for those who are a part of Simpsonwood Church, um, you have seen in our most recent communication um, and uh, a link in worship so far today, uh, just the opportunity to continue to be generous. This church is uh, so generous in so many ways, and I want to invite you to continue to support all the work that is taking place um, in this great community of faith through your continued giving. Hope everyone has a great week and may the God who is able to bless you and keep you present you faultless before his throne. Uh, watch over you in these incredible days. Amen.